Thank you. Uh, those of you who are ATCP certified and are looking for recertification credits, um, please let me know. Please let me know separately. Uh, if you tell me now, I, I will forget because uh, I, I, I just I know me. Um, but uh, drop me an email uh, if you don't mind. Uh, I want to remind you that you are still required to maintain your logbook and keep that up to date. Um, you know, the form that I send in is a reference form for the office. So when you send your logbook in, if they want to check, the first thing they'll do is they'll check the forms that have been sent in to them. And if you're not on the list, then they'll call me, which just happened two days ago. And, uh, you know, I want you to get the credits. Uh, this session today will get you 1.5 recertification credits. Okay, and I think we've, uh, we've waited quite long enough. 10 minutes is plenty, we'll go through that. Um, that's the PSA that I had up there before. If you have any questions about that, um, please feel free to check in with me, but I prefer that we, you did that uh, afterward. You, know, you can send me an email uh, if you'd like, um, or you know, go to the, 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 the BTS website. I'm, I believe that you'll find most of your answers there. So without further ado, we're gonna get started on harnesses. And this is a session that is devoted specifically to harnesses. Um, making sure that you are using the appropriate harness and using it in the, in, in the correct manner. Because if you don't, if you use it wrong or if you're using the wrong harness, then it's quite possible if you take a fall that that, um, that, that harness may, uh, may not do the job for you. And um, that would not be good. So let me get this a little bit bigger here. Um, can, I don't know what you can or cannot see, uh, but can you, is everybody, can everybody see the, um, I can't make it any smaller, damn it. The attendee list, it's on the right side of my screen. I don't know if that's visible to you or not. It's no, not, sir. it's not. It's not, okay. But we can exit full screen and see the attendee list at the same time. Well, I, I, don't, I don't need you to. I just was hoping that I didn't want it to be in the way. I didn't want it to obscure something else. All right, so here we go. Um, well, we did that. Send me a note. Oh, and the other thing, feel free. Um, we are, we are going to, uh, we are recording. We are going to uh, offer these, this session later on. Um, but if you want to take a picture of a screen today because you want to do something about it uh, before we release the, uh, the session, please feel free to take a picture of the screen. I don't care. You know, the, the, the copyright lawyers will not come crashing to your door. So um, the basic references that I'm using today for this discussion um, are loosely based around these uh, three items. Uh, the ANSI-Z 359.11, which is the latest um, uh, section, it's the latest standard on fall arrest harnesses that has come from the American Society of Safety Professionals. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, but the Z359 has become the uh, go-to standard. It's a suite of standards for um, uh, fall protection in the United States, certainly, and to a, a slightly lesser degree in North America. Um, the Canadians have um, uh, adopted most of these, um, and they will um, tweak them a bit to make them work for their, um, their way of thinking as far as fall protection is concerned. And they will typically put um, uh, a C on it, a Canadian standard uh, number on it that will be similar to this. But the Z359.11 is the, the, 
primary document, the primary standard that everybody in, uh, in the United States uses. Um, to a lesser extent, even though it's a regulation, we use the OSHA 29 CFR, as you can see there, subpart D and I. And they do indeed call it the final rule, uh, which is why I got three smiley faces down at the bottom. Um, but much more so than those two documents and those two groups of standards, we will be using common sense today, um, which as, as I'm sure some of you know, is not as common as it used to be. Okay, so I wanna start off with a couple of general notes here to put us in the mood, if nothing else. Um, safety experts and safety professionals outside of the entertainment industry, when they are dealing with working at height hazards, have a three-step process to evaluate and deal with that hazard. And that's what you're looking, seeing on the screen here. The entertainment industry typically does not think this way. Typically, the entertainment industry, when faced with a working at height hazard, will go directly to step number three. They will not pass go. They will not collect $200. Um, and they will go to step three, which is a fall arrest situation, protecting the walker, the worker once they have uh, fallen off the beam, okay? It is, by everybody's estimation, the worst way to respond to a fall, uh, a working at height hazard. I would venture to say that 95 to 98% of the time, that's where we end up at step three. But I would ask you, when you are, in a new work environment, um, you know, you're in a venue you've never been in before, um, and you have identified, or someone has identified hazards, working at height hazards, you know, you gotta climb a beam. Um, you gotta walk a beam, you know, you gotta climb uh, an unprotected ladder, whatever, whatever the situation may be. I would ask you to at least give a thought to steps one and two. Um, because as we're gonna discuss in, in, in a couple of minutes here, step three is a royal pain. It's very complicated and it's filled with possibilities of uh, injury and you know, things going wrong. It's, you know, it's, just, it's, it's a complex situation. And clearly step one is, is uh, the, the, the least complex. Uh, step two adds a, a, a component of risk in it because you are now looking for, um, you're now looking, you know, to more equipment being involved. Uh, and step three, you got a boatload of equipment and you got to do it all right because you can't mess up on any of it. Yeah, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I did want to point this out that um, we don't do it right. Um, but, um, you know, we end up, as I say, we end up with, typically we end up with step three, uh, but let's look at one and two first, because if there's an opportunity to do step one or step two, you want to take that opportunity. And here's why. Whoop. Mr. Tobin is knocking on the door. Okay. Um, and here's why you want to, uh, you want to look at this from a step one, two, and three perspective. The fall arrest rules and standards, the regulations and standards call for a minimum tensile strength for a single person system to be 5,000 pounds. That's the components of the system and how those components are joined together. And one of the ways that they arrived at that 5,000 pound tensile strength is because we have, they have identified the average actual strength required to arrest an individual who has fallen you know, off a beam or off the roof, whatever. It's going to take about 3,000 pounds or 13.33 kilonewtons to arrest that force. Now, OSHA in its regulations, for the most part, there are a couple of, uh, couple of situations that are a little bit different, but in general, OSHA will allow 1,800 pounds worth of force to get through the safety system 
and get to your body. And what this really means is that, the, you know, you take a fall and you're wearing safety equipment and you got all the systems in place and they all function properly. OSHA says that you're still allowed to receive on your person 1,800 pounds worth of force, eight, eight kilograms. What we are looking for to get to the human is 900 pounds. And if any of you, um, I'm looking at you, Camille, uh, if any of you have taken one of my classes, you will know what the next little story is going to be. If this were a face-to-face -face class, I would ask all of us to get up. And we were in, like say we were in a theater. I would ask all of us to get up and go on stage and go to one side of the stage and then run for all we were worth to the other side of the stage to the wall. And then when we got to the wall, leap up and hit the wall. But don't put your hands up. Just leap up and hit the wall. Um, you'd be surprised how many... Um, people will actually start getting up out of their seats and heading for the stage when I suggest this. Uh, usually it's the college kids. Um, but anyway, we don't actually do it, but you can imagine, you can imagine what, um, what kind of uh, injury, what kind of pain you're going to be uh, uh, exposed to. You're running as fast as you can for 40 or 50 or 60 feet, you leap up and hit that wall. It's going to hurt like hell. It's going to do some damage. You know, break your nose, a couple of black eyes, that kind of thing. That wall is going to exert an arresting force that's somewhere in between about 700 to 1,000 pounds worth of force. Now think about that for a second. 700 to 1,000 pounds worth of force is going to do some damage to you. It's going to hurt. It's going to leave a mark. OSHA is telling you that use all the safety gear, and they'll let 1,800 pounds of force, basically double the amount of that wall arresting force to get to your body. You can imagine what that's going to feel like, which is why when we design safety systems uh, for theaters, uh, our goal, and my goal, is to make sure that we limit the arresting forces to no more than 900 pounds, because we already know that 900 pounds is going to hurt like hell. So as we talk about harnesses and we talk about, you know, how they function, how they do their job, keep this screen in mind, please. Keep in mind the amount of forces that we're really talking about and the amount of damage that can be done. Okay. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about harnesses. I do want to remind you that questions are always, um, always uh, appropriate. And I'm trying to get that open because I see somebody's got something in the chat. Um, I'm not sure what, that's f what you're answering, Camille, but OK. Um, so we're going to talk about harnesses. And these are the two basic styles of harness that are available on the market and, you know, and for general fall arrest situations. Pretty much anything else that you're going to find on the market is going to be a variation on one of these two themes. Crossover style and either, depending on what you, what you, uh, where you, you know, your, your area, sorry. Um, you're going to call this either a suspender style harness or possibly an H style, the letter H style harness, because look, there's, there's the H. Okay. Um, I'm going to dispel one piece of folklore right off the bat. There is no such thing as a woman's harness or a man's harness. There, you know, all harnesses are gender neutral. They are designed to fit differently, clearly, um, and your body type is going to determine which one of these harnesses you prefer. Um, but there is, you can't call me up or, you know, my, my salespeople up and say, I need, you know, a, a woman's harness size medium. Um, just no such animal does not exist. That being said, the crossover style harness, I am told, 
um, by, a, by I would say a slim majority of women, I am told that this is a, a better fitting harness for them. I'm gonna take their word for it. I don't have the ability to measure that or deal with that personally. So if they tell me that this works better for them, great. But it is a slim majority of women. Um, that's that, that minority of, of women will tell me that this style, the H style harness, works better for them. Okay, you know, it's again, it's all about body type. <sighs> all right then, so what do we got? So we're gonna talk about the bits and pieces. Well, let me, give, let, me, let me go back and give you a couple of other things real quick here. First and foremost, a lot of people spend a lot of time in training sessions like this talking about how to put a harness on. I don't care how you put the harness on. I don't care what method you use. Uh, my goal and your goal is that once you are done putting the harness on, it is on properly and that it fits you properly. How you achieve that is entirely up to you, okay? Um, you know, I know, I know people who love to take every buckle apart and lay it out and then put it together. Frodo, you're back again. I let you in once already. Um, you know, they like to take all the buckles apart and lay it out and then, you know, lay it over them and start putting, uh, start putting, uh, the buckles together. That's not my personal choice. I find it confusing as hell and it takes me much longer to put on a harness. Um, but that's okay. We don't care how long it takes to put on the harness. We care how it fits and we care that, um, um, that it's sized properly and all the bits and pieces are in the right place. Okay. And oh, by the way, at the end of this, we will talk about inspection, um, maintenance and inspection. Okay, so don't let me forget. Because as previously noted, I will. All right, so I'm going to start with the H style harness and talk about how that needs to fit and, and you know, some of the things that are on the harness that um, uh, are good to know about. And um, you, you know you need to use, make sure you're using properly. Um, and I suppose I should at least mention it once. I wouldn't be a good uh, business owner, commercial guy if I didn't. But these are my harnesses. This is a, the Pro Plus line of fall arrest equipment, which Saps's rigging does provide. Um, these harnesses have uh, have uh, been. Um, We've taken basic harnesses and redesigned them to make them work better for you know, people in our industry. Uh, harnesses for construction workers and harnesses for technicians, theater technicians, electricians, riggers, carpenters, whoever. Um, they're different. They have to face different environments and they have different tasks to face. So, um, We've got the front and the back of a utility or H style, or if you will, suspender style harness. Uh, I'm gonna start with the back of this guy. I think that's what I'm gonna start with. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna start with. Okay, so the primary focus of a harness is the connection of the harness to the safety system that you're using whether it's you know, a lanyard going to an anchorage point or a lanyard going to a horizontal lifeline, a self-retracting device going to you know, anchorage points, lifelines, you know, whatever. The dorsal ring, which is this guy right here, uh, is the primary location for that connection. And just to be, make sure that we're all in the same boat here, this is the, uh, the dorsal ring. This is the location that we're talking about. It's extremely important that those of you who have, are in the habit of calling this a D-ring, stop doing that. Find a way to get out of that habit. That is not a D-ring. 
That is a dorsal ring because it's on the dorsal section of your back. A D-ring is a very specific piece of hardware um, that has, I'm sure, plenty of great functions in this world. Um, as a dorsal ring, it sucks to be, uh, to be technical about it. Um, and we'll come to that in just a second. But please, if you can, please get out of the habit of calling this a D-ring. It is a dorsal ring. Um, this particular ring is steel and it has a two inch diameter, giving it enough room to put not only the hook from your safety system, your lanyard or your self-retracting device, but if you are in need of, um, if you're in need of a, a, a rescue, it will have room to put and, and, and you're using a, uh, uh, a remote rescue and a remote assisted rescue system, they're going to want to put a hook in there and it needs to be able to fit. Now, dorsal rings by regulation and by common sense are only allowed to have one hook in it at any time. You know, during normal operations, during normal work, you know, doing, going about your business, you're only allowed to have one hook in there and one hook only. The only time that you would put a second hook in there is if you're in a, a situation where you're a fallen and you're being rescued. And as I say, they're using a remote assist rescue system and they're going to want to put a second hook, which is going to connect you to um, the, the device that's going to lower you to the floor. All right. So one hook and one hook only except for rescue. Now to go back to that D ring thing that I was talking about a minute ago. There are harnesses on the market, I'm not mentioning names, but if you have a harness with a D-ring as your dorsal ring, I want you to go and take a look at it at some point, not necessarily right now, but at some point, go take a look at it and see how large it is. If it's an older harness, and even if it's a current harness from a couple of some of the larger manufacturers, that D-ring is large enough to accept your primary hook, you know, your lanyard hook or your uh, self-retracting device hook, but it's not big enough to take a rescue hook. Um, most of the manufacturers, I think all of them at this point are aware of this and they are in the process of phasing out those hooks and replacing them with something, you know, similar to this. It can be an O ring like this. There's some large pair rings that, um, that we're starting to see on the market now. But, um, you know, if you've got a harness that's a couple of years old, you may want to take a look at that. Because if you take a fall and I'm using a remote access device to get you to the deck and I can't hook into your dorsal ring, where am I going to hook? Anywhere else on your harness that I'm going to hook is not going to be healthy for you. You know, I've got hip rings, right? I don't want to hook there because then you're going down sideways and oh, won't that be fun? You know, you're not going to hook into the little connector strap here, although it's going to be tempting because it's just below that dorsal ring. It's not going to hold. And if it does hold, you're going to be lying flat, stomach down, while we try and rescue you. Actually, you're going to fold up, and that is not going to be pleasant at all. The other place that's going to be real obvious to a rescuer is going to be one of the straps, one of the shoulder straps, because they're going to be up here somewhere. Yeah. And they're going, to put you, they're going to hook you there because they don't have ability to get into that dorsal ring because it's a D-ring. Um, if you think I'm belaboring the point, I'm not. I'm doing it on purpose because it is a huge problem and one that you need to be aware of. This dorsal ring needs to be large enough to take two hooks, two full-size hooks, even though you're only allowed to put one in there under normal circumstances. Okay, now I think I've beaten it to death. Um, the other thing about a dorsal ring is its location. I'm sorry, I'm jumping back and forth here and I apologize, so. Um, please note that the dorsal ring is not physically connected to the, to the harness. 
it is captured. There's a, you know, this whole plate that makes up the dorsal ring. There's a bar that runs across here. The webbing comes through. It's kind of woven through the, um, through the dorsal ring and then woven through this plate, which allows you to adjust the height of that plate, which is really important. Going back to the previous slide, he said, warning you that I'm moving. Um, <coughs> you wanna make sure that this dorsal ring is in the appropriate location. Um, let's see if I can make this just a little bit bigger. Eek. Yeah, that's not too bad. So you wanna adjust this. This dorsal ring needs to be in the right place on your back. Now you don't need to take out um, you know, your tape measure and measure it every time you put it on. Um, you know, we don't have to be that specific, but you need to be in the right in the right ballpark. Where I want this top bar, which is the the bar that the webbing is you know wrapped around. You can't really see the bar because the webbing is over at this point. But this bar wants to be roughly even with the center line of your shoulder blades. On this particular gentleman or person, I would suggest that you know. If, if you're going to get exact about it, I would be looking to get that, that bar up another half an inch. Do I think it's a big issue where it is? No, I do not. If the dorsal ring and the bar are way up here on your neck, as is often the case, then you're going to have some problems. You're going to be wearing the hook in the back of your head, and you're going to, be, you're going to lose some hair, and you're going to lose some scalp. But more importantly, it's going to put added, added pressure on your chest because you will be more vertical. And I, I, you know, I know that doesn't sound, it doesn't make sense. You know, it's kind of contradictory the way you would think it would, what you would want it. But if you're absolutely vertical and the harness is pulling and compressing on you, it's going to make it more difficult to breathe. And you don't want to, you don't want it to be difficult to breathe in this situation. It's, you've got enough problems. You don't want to add that one to it. The same is true if that dorsal ring is too low. If this bar is down in here somewhere, putting the dorsal ring down here, when it when it uh, when it um, when it saves you, when it when it engages. Sorry, I lost that word there for a second. When it engages, you're going to end up lying. Uh, you're going to be doing what I call a Superman thing. You're going to be at an angle. Your body is going to be positioned kind of like this. And once again, all the pressure is going to be put up against your chest and you're going to find it really difficult to breathe. All right? So the location of the dorsal ring is extremely important. I'm talking about the, the location up and down your back. Okay. If you haven't figured out that the, the, the dorsal ring needs to be centered on your back left to right. If, if that hasn't occurred to you yet, you might want to think about a different occupation. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if this dorsal ring is way over here somewhere, you have put the harness on improperly, really improperly. You have, you've gone out of your way to put it on wrong and you've got to get that straightened out. It's got to be centered on your back and should be uh, at the height which is roughly centered across your shoulder blades on that line across your shoulder blades. Okay. Any, uh, where do I get? Ooh, two questions in chat. Let me, uh, Ryan McAlpine, you are asking, should there be gender specific harnesses? I don't see any reason why there should. All right, simple enough. Why not? Because, well, if, this, if we were in a face-to-face, -face, I would ask you to look around the room. And you would not be looking at different genders. You're looking at different body types. You know, I'm 5'7 on a really good day, and I'm a little bit on the wide side. All right, so... I'm going to be looking for a harness that has, you know, a short torso like I do. Uh, other people have really long torsos. Um, women, you know, their 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 um, you know, more full-chested 
than others, you know, I mean, there's a, you know, bigger hips, you know, whatever. Um, it's not about gender, it's about uh, body type. Right. Fair enough, makes sense to me. Okay. And Thomas Green has just sent us a link. Yeah. Um, any information is always um, a good, um, uh, any, any good information is always a good thing to have. Uh, so thank you for, for that, Thomas. Um, uh, folks, take that down. I would, I would point out to you that it is part of the construction um, rules that OSHA has, and they, they categorize those into their 1926 group of uh, fall arrest regulations. Typically, we don't deal with 1926, the construction trade, very often. And the 1910, which is the one I referenced in the very beginning, uh, is more stringent. So I default to that because I would always prefer to, to, uh, to, uh, to go, you know, to go to a more stringent code. Um, Scott Dixon, sternum ring. Yes, my friend, we are getting to that, but um, we're gonna do that on the crossover style harness. So, um, you know, bear with me for, for a, couple of, a couple of minutes here. Okay, so dorsal ring. We've beaten that to death, I think, and we are good to go. Uh, working down our mannequin friend's back, we have hip rings. And these are, on this slide, uh, and this harness, they are D-rings. And we call them out as D-rings because they are shaped as a D. These, these, D <coughs> these rings are not there for fall arrest ever. They are there for work positioning or restraint. And we talked about, well, at least I showed you the uh, step two was restraint. And that, that literally does mean tying yourself off so that you can do your work, but you can't step into the hazard zone, if you will. Um, so they work really well for that. They do not work for fall arrest. And if you're connected to, um, to uh, a hip ring for, uh, and you take a fall on your, that's where your safety equipment is connected to, um, you're, in, you're in for a big surprise and a world of hurt, okay? Um, oops, sorry. Oh, okay. So we're, we're gonna go here, all right. I'm moving around and I apologize, but um, my fingers are, uh, are fat and ugly. Um, on the back, the next thing we wanna talk about are the leg straps and on this particular mannequin, this particular slide, we did them mostly right and definitely wrong on purpose, okay? The mostly right is over here on, on, on this side. Um, and you'll note that the, the leg straps are not horizontal. They're pulled up uh, into the groin area. And the reason for that, my friends, is that when you take a fall, and let's go and remember the amount of force that we're talking about in this, um, in, 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 a, in a fall arrest situation. Um, I'm trying to get to, all right. Um, Nick, hang on to that for a minute, okay? Yell at me if I don't, if I don't come back to that question. I wanna get through the leg straps. Um, so they're, up in, they're, they're pulled up into the groin. And the reason for that is they're gonna go there anyway. You take a fall and you apply 900, 1,000, 1,800 pounds worth of force to this harness, it's going to move. And it's going to move as much as you allow it to move. And I'm here to tell you that if you don't take steps to protect certain parts of your body, you're going you're gonna to be, as I say, in a world of hurt. Many people will do this. You know, with leg straps are horizontal across the thighs. It's wrong. And it's going to be a painful experience should you take a fall. You're going to want to pull the leg straps up into your groin and make sure that they are up there and they are tight. 
you know, you're going to get them comfortable up in here in between all the little bits and pieces. But um, they're going to, you want them up there. Otherwise, they're going to go up there anyway. So you want to direct it. You don't want them having their own free will. I say this is mostly right because, frankly, I would like to see this up maybe just a little bit higher. I'd like to see it at a bit more of an angle into the groin area. But for our purposes, I think this is, this is an okay thing. Um, so many times I see people, they'll be walking around, you know, and on the deck, it's great. You know, they loosen up their straps and the, the, the leg straps are flapping around horizontal across their thighs. Um, but then they don't fix them when they go back up in the air. And if they take a fall, well, you can imagine the problem. And it is not gender specific, okay? You know, you can do permanent damage, male or female, does not matter. Um, and clearly, you don't want to do that. The next element that I want to talk about, well, let's go back. Nick, you asked me about uh, hip rings and whether or not you can put tools on them. Um, I think you asked me this question earlier in the week. I think that was you. And, you know, I've been thinking about that. Um, the, first, the first response I have to um, putting tools on anything when you're working at height is why do you have tools? I think you asked me originally about a tool belt. And, I mean, you know, my, my response is why would you have a tool belt? You should have only the tools that you need and they should be tied off to you. Um, they should be tied off in a manner that if you take a fall, will do the least amount of damage. And that damage can be, you know, if the tool, you know, if a screwdriver or, or a, a C wrench gets in between the strap and your body, especially in a really you know, significant compression point, like down on your hips, it's going to do significant damage, you know. It is going to hurt you, um, you know, and, and, you know, create a lot of pain, if nothing else. Um, you also don't want uh, your tool lanyard, your tether, whatever you want to call. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you don't want it to, um, to be so long that when you take the fall, you end up with a screwdriver up your nose. You know? Bill. Yeah. Bill, uh, may, may I comment? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm using a Miller uh, harness right now in the, my work. Right. And most, most of these companies now are coming out with these nifty little, you know, slide in, lock in tool bags with various accoutrements that, that are made for the harnesses now. Okay. Uh, Miller in particularly does it. So, right. uh, if you're not if you're not uh, if you're not bound to an older harness that you're not keen to replace yet, um, most of these companies now are accommodating that so that you don't have to jerry rig, you know, tools or you know slipper wrench through a ball and loop. Or like that. Right. So so uh, I think the companies I think the companies are keeping up with that now. Maybe not. Well, I'm fam I'm familiar with the Miller product line. Um, and you know that device is is a good device. I'm not personally a big fan of it, not because of what it does, but what its potential is. And and I see a potential. I mean, first of all, I believe that that device was designed for the construction industry. And I see people in our industry. I can I can see how they would abuse that, overload it, fill it up, put too much stuff in it, put too little stuff in it, maybe not tie stuff off properly. Um, well, that's that's back to the that's back to the common sense uh, category, isn't it? Then well, well, that goes to the common sense category, yes. <laughs> um, but you know, knowing the common sense is not all that common these days. I want to take the steps to limit the, uh, an individual's ability to do harm to themselves or to somebody else. Um, and I will always counsel, I will always recommend that whether you're using, uh, you know, a, a, a manufactured tool belt or not, that you only take up whatever gear you absolutely need. You don't take up anything else. You don't take up the what if, you know, because you're just increasing the chances of something coming down from 75 feet. And that, that won't go well. Um, 
and you had asked, uh, not, not you, Andrew, but I think Nicholas, you asked about whether you should wear a tool belt under a harness or over a harness. I'm gonna just go back to my comment. I don't think a tool belt is appropriate in a working at height application at all. Um, I would certainly never put anything in between me and the harness, because if I take a fall, it's going to hurt me. And you know, it could conceivably kill you if you've got you know, a screwdriver in there and it manages to get itself wedged in there and it stabs you in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the stomach or something. You know, you could end up dying up there. Um, and, you know, where's the fun in that? So I would never wear um, uh, a tool belt or anything other than clothes in between me and, um, and my harness. I would not recommend a tool belt on the outside of a harness because you don't know where it's going to go physically on your body when you take a fall and you don't know if it's going to spill its contents or you know pinch something on you pinch a nerve or something on you um, once again i'm always going to recommend that you take up what you need and either using an appropriate pouch that is designed for that harness uh, or um, uh, you know a tether that is tied off with thought in mind okay All right, we have some questions. We're going to drop back just for a minute. Frodo, do you mind, Frodo, if I uh, if I uh, do this publicly? I know you sent it to me privately. Um, um, and Camille, um, Camille asks, with working outdoors in cold weather, are there any concerns about? wearing a coat under a harness. Uh, there are no concerns, well, yes, there are concerns, but those concerns do not dictate that you can't wear a coat under your harness or a sweater, hoodie, you know, whatever. Um, you just have to make sure that that, that that article of clothing or those layers of clothes do not um, shift the harness around in such a way that it can potentially hurt you. You know, the harness, if you're wearing a big, heavy um, overcoat, for, for example, um, you know, the harness isn't going to fit you properly. And maybe um, the dorsal ring is going to ride up on your, um, uh, on, on your back and, and get in the wrong way. Or it, um, it um, uh, you know, it, it could be lower. Um, I haven't heard from Frodo, so I'm going to uh, answer his question publicly on an older harness with a smaller two inch dorsal ring. Could I use a large, self-locking steel carabiner. Um, no, you cannot. Uh, because now you're gonna to have to put another connector to that connector. And that is not something that uh, anybody um, um, will uh, permit that I'm aware of. I don't know of any harness manufacturer that uh, will permit that. Okay. I think that takes care of the chat stuff, maybe more better to go with multiple single layers than lay that lay flatter than a coat. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it depends on where you are and how, how cold it gets. Um, all right. Well, me, me again. Yeah. Um, the only reason I brought that up was because I went across Canada with a kids tour and we were outside and the riggers all recommended to us, you know, we asked a similar question and they said, you know, and the RCMP also recommends this, oddly enough, that, that you can stay warmer with medium layers of fabric. That keeps you warmer, but at the same time, as far as wearing a harness is concerned, you don't have to worry about a thick layer that's going to shift between the harness and your, and your, and your actual body. Right. And since they're the guys that were up there working in the cold all the time, I, 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 uh, my reasoning was that they knew a hell of a lot more about it cold than I did. So I did what they said. Right just for what that's worth. No, and I would agree. I mean, that's my personal preference is to wear layers. I don't like big bulky stuff anyway. Um, of course, I live in Northern Vermont now and you know what they say about Vermonters. You know, you're from Vermont, you are from Vermont if you have worn a parka and shorts at the same time. Um, but I'm bump. Um, okay. 
moving on. We just did um, the leg straps. Now we have to get to the, uh, the, the sub pelvic strap. And let's go back up to the full size harness thing, sub pelvic strap, which is pointed out right here, but you really can't see it. <sighs> which one is it? There it is. It's, it's difficult to see even in this shot, but there's a little piece of webbing right here that connects both leg straps. It's just sewn together. You can see the stitching, the white stitching on either side. It's just a piece of webbing. Nothing fancy or complex about it at all. It's called a sub pelvic strap. It is not a requirement on a harness. OSHA doesn't require it. ANSI doesn't require it. They certainly recommend it, but they do not require it. But what this device does, it does two things. First, it'll take and spread the force of that fall all across your butt. Now, this is a good thing because 900, 1,000, 1,800 pounds worth of force, if it's going to get to your body, you want to direct it to someplace that you can tolerate better. And where, where better on your body than on your butt, right? Um, so having that put the force into your butt is a good thing because you got more padding there. More importantly, at least in my mind, more importantly, is that subpelvic strap will reduce, significantly reduce the amount of uplift in the harness because it will catch on your butt and it will reduce the amount of the, the ability of the harness to ride up. And I think that's worth its weight in gold because now I don't have nearly as much movement in the harness that I can't predict exactly where it's going to go. So if I limited it, I'm, I'm doing a whole lot better. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of sub pelvic harnesses, uh, sub pelvic straps are on all my harnesses, except for the rope access harness. The downside, and there is a downside to a sub pelvic strap, is if you're wearing a harness and it does not fit you properly and it's not located properly, it can create a problem. The strap, as you see here, needs to be underneath your butt so that when you take a fall, it catches on your butt, you know, right there on your cheeks, okay? It wants to, you know, almost create a seat like situation. If you start out, and I've seen people do this, where the, the sub pelvic strap is way up here on top of your butt, there's nothing for it to catch on, which means now it's just, it's not gonna do any of that padding thing that we talked about, and it's not gonna reduce the uplift, and it's just gonna be part of the uplift, and it's gonna ride up here, and you run the risk of it impacting on your kidneys. So we don't wanna do that, trust me. So if you've got a harness that has a sub pelvic strap on it, make sure that the harness fits you properly, that the strap is in the right location. It needs to be under your butt, not on top of it. Okay. Okay. Something I should have said it back in the very beginning, I'm going to swing back to, let's just also check. I have one question in chat. from Josh. Okay, we've got a, we've got a, 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 a clothing recommendation. Thank you, Josh. Can I, can I assume that you get a, a royalty on, 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 recommend, on buying a true work, true work parka? <laughs> only kidding, only kidding. But that, thank you for that. Okay. What I was going to say, when you are working in a situation in a, a venue where they are providing you the harnesses and you have never seen the harness before, the one that you are putting on, um, you want to take at least, at the very least, you want to take five minutes to make sure that the harness is fitting you properly, that first of all, that it's the right size harness and that it fits you properly. Um, you get done in three minutes, great. Go back and check it again, okay? Fit is all important. It's, it's, it's what makes or breaks a safety situation, a rescue situation. So take the time and do it right. It should be at least five minutes, okay? 
So we've gone and we've done the back of this mannequin. I want to go over and just do one item on the front and, and the gods protect me. I have to say this out loud. I don't believe that I have to do this, but this connector strap, which keeps your shoulder straps from falling off, it has to be connected. Now, you would think that this is common sense and that everybody, you know, oh, look, there's a connector. We got to connect this. Um, you know, 25% of the people that I work with, you know, when I go do a, a training session or something and they're wearing, they don't connect it. Well, not only do you run the risk of falling out of the harness because your shoulder straps are going to fall off, but you're going to lose a tooth if this thing's flapping in a breeze and comes up and smacks you in the face. Connect your strap. If you're wearing an H style or a suspension style, make sure that's connected and make sure it's adjusted properly. And adjusted properly is what you are looking at now. What I don't want to see is a great big loop here you know, so that, you know, the, 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 the shoulder straps have the ability to fall off your shoulder. Because if that happens, you are going to fall out of the harness. It's pretty much a guarantee. Because once you lose a shoulder strap, you're going to lose the other one. It's, 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 it's the way it works. You know, gravity does what it does. Once you lose the shoulder straps, your center of gravity down here is going to make you pitch forward. You'll, you'll, you'll turn upside down. And the only thing holding you in place will be the leg straps. And it won't matter whether or not you've done the leg straps improperly or properly. You'll still come out of them because there's no, you're nothing holding your shoulders in them. Okay? Connect the shoulder strap. Make sure that it's adjusted properly. This is what I'm looking at for. What I don't want is to see an hourglass kind of a shape. Oops. An hourglass, get out of there. An hourglass kind of a shape where the, these, two sections, these two pieces of the strap are pulled in to each other. If you over tighten it and you take a fall and this does, is allowed to ride up, you're gonna put that buckle up into your neck and it's going to choke you. Clearly you don't wanna do that. Okay, all right. Um, there it is, okay. I don't have anybody in chat at the moment. No. Okay. Moving on. Oh, it's three o'clock. We are moving on quickly. All right. All right. If we're done with the H style, we're going to go to the crossover style. Um, we're going to talk about the back just very briefly. It's all the same. There's really no difference on the, um, uh, oop, that's the sternum. Okay. So we'll get to that. There is no difference on the back. Leg straps up where they need to be, sub pelvic down there where it needs to be, dorsal ring, you know, it's the same as any other harness. You know, the back of a harness is, is pretty much the same for all safety harnesses. Work rope access, another animal, we'll get to that, I hope. So let's go to the front. And this is where we run into a significant problem. Not sure, yeah, okay. So this is the sternum ring. Somebody asked me about a sternum ring earlier, and this is what this is what we're going to get into here. This particular sternum ring is a D ring, as you can see. Um, this is an older photograph. I believe that we have turned this into a pair ring, so it's much larger than this is now. You are allowed, you are permitted to use a sternum ring for fall arrest, but only when you limit the fall distance to two feet, okay? Kind of, you can do the metric conversion, you know, later. Uh, <laughs> I didn't forget you, I know you're there. Um, but uh, two feet is all you are allowed to fall. And you don't wanna fall any further than that. Going back to this guy. With the connection here, you take a fall, all the force is coming right out of the, your, your, your belly button, your chest, right? It's coming out, going up, and your head will snap back because that's what happens. That's what, you know, when the, when the force is applied low, the back of your head goes back. It's why we have headrests on cars and you don't have a headrest here and your head can snap back much further than you want it to and it will cause significant damage, right? possibly permanent damage. Two feet is all you get. 
don't you don't ever want to get i wouldn't go to two feet i would limit my fall distance with an sr with a self-retracting device to six or eight inches and that's it but you're allowed up to two feet and the cautionary tale here is that a lot of people will use this style of harness and make a connection here on a um, uh, on a ladder rail or a ladder lifeline type system it's where a fixed ladder against the wall and it's got a a sleeve and a, you know that trolley kind of thing that rides up and down and those devices they say right on the device it's a maximum lanyard length you know the connection from it to you is three feet so if you follow their rules you're breaking this rule and you will regret it all right, so if you are using that type of system where it's fixed to the, to the face of a ladder, you're climbing a, a fixed ladder you know, up to the grid or something, you don't ever want to uh, put yourself in a position where you can fall greater than two feet. The other issue that I have with the sternum ring, you know, you have to remember about the two feet. The other issue is positioning. And this is extremely important. This sternum ring, whatever size it is, must be in between your belly button and the bottom of your breastbone, you know, with the bottom of your, your, your rib cage. Okay? It can't be any higher than that. Because if it is, if, if this device is up here somewhere and you take a fall and everything rides up, everything rides up. It's going to put itself, this, this V is going to put itself into your neck. And not only do you run the risk of choking yourself to death, you also run the risk, if you don't do that, you also run the risk of collapsing your carotid arteries on both sides. And, you know, you don't want to do that. All right, I got a question in chat here if I can get it to open. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't get the reference at first, Nick. Um, yes, total fall distance, free fall and deceleration. Now, you're in a two foot fall. I don't see that you're going to have any measurable deceleration, but you know, it's maximum fall distance. I mean, that's the safest way of, of, of dealing with that. And the idea here, So not all SLRs. Um, well, why don't you stop typing, Nick, and, and why don't you unmute? Um, talk to me about the SRLs that have a longer deceleration, because um, I think we may be talking apples and oranges here. Sorry, Bill. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. I was typing in had a bit of a moment with SLR and SRL. Um, so I've come across some of the bigger SRLs that have a 54, 54 inch total free fall, I want to say. The, um, we've had those 100 footers or uh, some, some ladder climbing systems have bigger or longer SRLs. And if I'm not mistaken, they have a longer free fall, if I'm not mistaken. I don't have the in front of me. That's why I was asking. So. Depending on the class of S and, and over in the States, we, we're, not, we don't, we're not supposed to call them SRLs anymore. We're supposed to call them SRDs for SR SRDs, yeah. contracting devices primarily because number one, um, the American Society of Safety Professionals have nothing better to do. Um, but also because there are a significantly larger number of different types of self-retracting devices on the market now. They do different things. Um, yeah, some of the really long ones, 100, 150 foot SRDs, will have a longer um, uh, free fall distance. Um, I've never seen anything, however, greater than 42 inches, right? which, is, which is still longer than, you know, it's, it's greater than 24. Uh, yeah. Granted, let me ask you a question. This is going to go to the common sense thing. If you're going to go and climb a horizontal, uh, excuse me, a, a, a wire rope ladder up to a truss, 
and there's a self-retracting device hanging there and you grab that hook and you check it, which everybody does before they clip in, right? You yank on it, right? Yeah. If that thing played out 42 inches, what would you do? Yeah, you, you couldn't put it on your, on your uh, dorsal. No, what I would do is I would tell, I would go to somebody and say, this is no good, I'm not going to use it. And here's the reason. All of the SRDs are basically designed to lock up within six or eight inches. Once again, kind of, you'll have to do the metric conversion. And I think you could pull Nick, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're in Australia? No, I'm actually, I'm originally from South Africa, but I live in Vegas. Ah, okay. Um, you know, the, the fall distance is the kicker here. If, if I've got a device that says it's gonna, fall, it's gonna let me fall 42 inches before it locks up, and knowing that it has almost no shock absorption in it, why would I use it? Because yeah. it's damn near gonna kill me. Yeah, just because this, the, the, the steel cages on the fixed ladders, that standard has changed. I know it's only in, I think it's 20, 30 something, but a lot of people are now just throwing in big SRLs and then clipping it to the sternum. So that why, that's why I was curious. In right. that case, you'd have to put it on the dorsal, correct? Well, with a longer SR, with a I would, longer SR. I would, I would always put it on my dorsal because I don't like things being in my face. Yeah. And, you know, and rubbing, you know, rubbing my nose, you know. Um, I was going to make a, a joke about a nose job there, but <laughs> it, 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 didn't, it didn't work. Um, but let's, we got to go back to the original concept here. If you're going to work with a device that will definitely extend, allow a 42 inch free fall, why would you use it when you know that there are devices, even though the label says up to 42 inches, that it's supposed to lock up between, you know, to six or eight inches at best. You know? yeah, that makes sense. I was just curious. You know? Um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, whether you put it on a dorsal or on the um, the sternum ring, I mean, you know, I don't like putting it on the sternum ring. I don't like using a sternum ring for much of anything personally. Um, uh, I, you know, I, as I say, I don't like it in my face. It just, you know, it's knocked off my glasses too many times. But let's go back here. Um, I just want to repeat, I don't want to get sidetracked from this issue because it is a huge problem. And now that I know I have two people from South Africa on, in, on, the, on the call here, um, uh, I had a problem in a class that I was teaching in Johannesburg many, many years ago um, for, um, for Joanne, um, God, I've, I blanked on her last name, up, uh, up, Upstage Lighting. We was doing a class for them in Johannesburg and we were in their warehouse doing a hands-on and it was my fault. I had too many people in the class and I couldn't keep track of everybody. And a couple of people had, you know, kind of wandered off to the side and they were messing around with a harness and they, they put a girl in it and, they, and she just, you know, stepped off a platform to hang in it to see what it was like. And it rode up and it was choking her. And they didn't realize what was going on. She was no longer able to speak. And I just luckily just looked, I looked over in that direction and saw what was going on and got her down. Scared the crap out of me because it's that easy for it to happen. You have to make sure that this sternum ring, whether you're going to use it or not, is in between the bottom of your rib cage, right at the bottom of your breastbone there and above your belly button. So it wants to be in this area here. Otherwise you run a very real risk of this V riding up and getting up into your neck and causing significant damage. Okay. Um, I managed to jump over the, uh, the other slides, but it's an okay thing given the time restriction. And I wanted to talk briefly about this arrangement here. I wanna see if I have it. Yeah, that's not as easily seen. I think that's probably easier. We talked, I talked earlier about the dorsal ring and you're only allowed to put one hook in it, right? Well, and 
you know, that's true. But you're in situations any number of times where you need two safety systems. The, you know, the wire rope ladder to the truss is a classic example of um, where we in our industry get into that uh, situation. You got to climb a wire rope ladder, you get to the truss, and then you got to walk, you know, 20, 30 feet down the truss to get to the lighting instrument that you need to fix or focus or whatever, or you're going to your, um, your follow spot chair. Right? Two separate safety systems, but they have to work one right after the other. And if you only had a dorsal ring, you would be in, you would have difficulty. Um, you wouldn't be able really to meet the requirements and stay safe throughout the entire journey. You know, you need two separate systems. What you don't want to do is, you know, clip your, your uh, uh, SRD, clip that hook into your dorsal ring, climb up the wire ladder, sit on the truss, disconnect that one, take the lanyard out of your pocket or wherever the heck you kept it, clip it into your dorsal ring and then clip it into the horizontal lifeline so you can walk the truss to get down to the instrument or your follow spot chair, whatever's going on, All right? You've disconnected yourself at probably the most dangerous part. You're sitting 43 feet in the air on a piece of 12 inch box truss and now you're messing around with stuff on your back and it's not the place to be doing that. So we came up with this and yes, I would, I would love to say that I invented this. I did not. Um, but you know, we like to, we like to make sure people know about it. We came, we, we have an extended dorsal ring. It's a secondary dorsal ring. This is connected up to the webbing, just like everything else. And you get two connection points. The way, the way I typically do this and the way I recommend this is if it's at that wire rope ladder and then truss situation, I would pick the, uh, the hook from the SRD into the extended dorsal ring. It's like nine inches of extension there. Then I would take my lanyard, which I'm gonna use on the horizontal lifeline, I'd clip it into the primary dorsal and I would take it, take the other end, the loose end, and I would clip it into the Velcro lanyard hook keeper. Okay, I clip it into there just to keep it out of the way. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But now I've got the secondary dorsal is protecting me from uh, uh, on, while I'm on the wire rope ladder. And I get to the top of the wire rope ladder, I, I can make a choice. I've already got my lanyard in here. I can disconnect if I want from the retractable or I can leave it in. Depends on how far, you know, how far away you're walking down the truss, right? But the nice part about it, because that retractable has about 10 pounds worth of uh, retraction in it, um, that this secondary dorsal will be up here, you know, kind of behind your head. You can reach it, you know? I don't know about you, but I got short, stubby arms. So it's hard for me to reach stuff down on my back. So I can reach it to do stuff with it. Right, connect or disconnect. Um, so, assuming I'm not going to do anything with it, I'm just going to leave it connected. I take the hook which I've placed into my keeper up here. I take that hook when I get to the truss, I put it in the horizontal lifeline, and off I go. I go and do my job, and I come back. And before I come down the ladder, I disconnect from the horizontal lifeline. It's keeping me safe the entire trip and making sure that I, um, I you know, that I don't. Um, get into a situation where I'm not paying attention to the proper thing. I mean, part of this is about focus. I don't want to have to focus on this area. I want to focus on the fact that I'm 43 feet in the air, sitting on a piece of 12 inch box truss. Um, coming back to, no chats, okay. Coming back to this little keeper guy. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Mm. This is a, a relatively new device. It came out with the, the latest iteration of the ANSI standards for harnesses, the Z359.11, which I believe was in 2017. Um, but so, you know, they now require it on, uh, on the harness and it's to prevent people from doing something really stupid. 
they'll take, and I think we probably in the past, we've all done it. You've got your lanyard, regardless of whether you got a secondary dorsal on there or not, but you've got your lanyard hooked into your dorsal and the other end flapping in a breeze. You don't want it, you know, dangling around your feet and tripping you. So they clip it into something that's easy. And the first easy is the hip rings. So they've got these steel hip rings here and they clip into it. That's a robust uh, ring. It's not designed for fall arrest, but it's, you know, it's got some strength to it. If you take a fall and th this lanyard hangs up on something, the truss you're falling next to, or, or you know, a lighting instrument, whatever, I mean, there's always you know, a possibility. If it connects, it may end up becoming your primary fall arrest uh, device. And that's going from here to here. This is not good. You know, because now you're going to put all that force in this area. You're going to end up, after you're done bouncing around, you're going to end up sideways and nothing's good is going to come of that. So now we have this Velcro keeper up here. Um, so, you know, you take that fall and if it does hook on something, it just simply rips it out. Okay. Um, if you're buying a harness or if you have a harness that has some type of keeper on it, please take a look at it um, and evaluate the design of that keeper. I'm seeing some plastic keepers that are reasonably robust. And there's one in particular that the only way that the hook will come out is if it's pulled straight out. If it's pulled to the side in either direction, it won't come out of the keeper, but will yank the strap in that direction. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, having things move in a direction that we plan for isn't going to happen in the in the theatrical world. Okay, um, we're getting close on time. Let me see where what else. Oh, there's a pretty decent shot of the secondary dorsal ring. What is this? Uh, okay, we do have time for this. Um, very briefly. A rope access harness. Um, you know, uh, first thing that I should tell you is I'm not a big fan. Uh, I'm not a big fan of rope access harnesses being used for fall arrest in particular. They are called rope access harnesses for a reason, and that's because that's what their primary job is, is to do rope access. It is, you know, a function of the harness. It's a job. It's not a, um, uh, a situation, you know, it's not fall arrest. It's, I'm gonna do, do this work where I have to sit in a harness or I have to use the harness to get to someplace remote or challenging to get to. That is its primary job. Um, fall arrest is secondary. Let's see if I've got my biggest concern. Well, two biggest concerns. Number one is the dorsal ring is a fixed location all well and good for making sure that you have it in the right place. It has an adjustment strap here, but that doesn't have, that strap doesn't elongate when you take a fall. So any shock absorption that you've got because of the, uh, the, the, the dorsal ring sliding, oops, where'd that come from? Sorry about that folks, let me find out where I was here. Okay. Um, any, any, any shock absorption you got from the dorsal ring sliding, you lose in this application. Um, also, da, 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 there we go. No pelvis, sub-pelvic strap. You know, so you've lost that also. The other problem I have with it is look at all the stuff. I mean, this stuff is great for rope access, but it's all stuff that can do damage to you in a fall arrest situation. Okay, so, and I bring this up because a lot of people, I mean, it's, it's, it's trendy. People really like it. I mean, yeah, you know, they're sexy. I mean, I, I'm a grant you that. No, no arguments there. Uh, they look cool. But, and people are buying them who have no rope access skills or training whatsoever. And they don't do rope access, but they buy these to, and use them for fall arrest. They're doing two things, folks. They're spending way too much money 
and they're putting themselves at a risk. I mean, it's not a huge risk, but they're putting themselves at an elevated risk of creating you know, injury that you didn't need to have happen if you were wearing a regular fall arrest harness. You know, you're gonna wear a fall arrest, a rope access harness, you know, good on you, but just remember that if you take a fall on those, in one of those things, um, even if everything is, is, is where it's supposed to be, even if it fits you properly, it's still gonna do more damage to you than a standard fall arrest harness will. Okay. Um, I want to go back to, I think, yeah, let's do this one. We want to talk about inspection real quick. We have a few minutes, right? Yeah. Um, a couple of things to remember when you're inspecting at harness. And the first thing to remember is that the rules state and ANSI, they all state that you inspect your harness every time you put it on. I'm going to uh, switch over to chat here if I can get the damn thing to open. Lumbar ring, what about the lumbar ring, Scott? Can you- uh, uh, I was wondering what its purpose is. The lumbar ring is for an Australian rappel. It's, when, it's for showing off, near as I can tell. <laughs> uh, okay. You know, Australia, what, I, what we've always called as an Australian rappel is when you come down head first. And um, I've used them in uh, performance situations. Um, I'm sure that there is probably, you know, and oh my God, every once in a while when it comes in handy. But um, I couldn't tell you what it is because I don't, I don't use rope access. Okay, um, so it has, it has no fall arrest purpose and it has no positioning purpose. Um, to my, yeah, I don't know about the positioning, but it has no fall arrest purpose. You would never use it for right. fall arrest. Okay. Um, it's in the wrong place. Camille asks if, um, we sh if you recommend doing a hang test when fitting people in a harness. Um, no, I don't. I don't. I don't see that it's going to, you know, it, it could help a little bit, I guess, but you want to make sure that the harness fits properly um, because of, you know, the training that you've been given in that particular harness and make sure all the bits and pieces are where they're supposed to be. A hang test is okay, but a hang test is only a fraction of the force that a fall is going to, uh, to, to uh, exact on, on, on your body. So, I guess what you could say is a hang test. If, if you're uncomfortable in a hang test, then you really got to get back into that harness and make sure it's adjusted properly. Because if you can't, if you don't like the hang test, you're going to hate the, uh, the arrest situation. Does that, uh, does that help? Okay, thank you. Inspection. You're going to do it every time you put on the harness. If you're, you know, if you work for a venue or you work for an organization or something that has harnesses, um, and even as an individual, my recommendation, and it's an ANSI recommendation also, that you have the harness inspected on a regular basis by a third party. Um, and the reason for that is you get complacent. For those of you who rig all the time, uh, or I should say did rig, all the time, um, you can get complacent. You know, if you're looking at the harness every day because you wear it every day, you're not going to be looking at it the same way on day 12 that you did on day one. And I would recommend, and OSHA would love to see the paperwork on a third party uh, inspection. That doesn't have to be some other organization. It just has to be somebody who is, you know, has familiarity with the systems and is trained to uh, use and inspect harnesses. You don't have to hire somebody. It can be somebody within your own organization. But you're going to inspect that harness every day. And, you, you know, you don't want to give up on it. You don't want to go easy on a slop off on it. When you're inspecting it, you're going to do the usual things looking, I'm not going to get into looking at the brackets and the buckles and making sure they're all 
you know, seated properly, they work properly, they're not cracked or worn and all that good stuff. You're gonna look for rips and tears, of course, but you're also gonna feel it. You're gonna run it through your hands. You're gonna run the webbing through your hands because the major issue that we have in our industry is heat. Um, and again, I apologize. I used to know what the conversion was, but I forget. But polyester, which is what 95% of the harnesses are made out of, um, and nylon for that, which is the other 5%, they suffer permanent damage at about 180, so it's 180 to 190 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere in there, right? And you can do that. You get, you lean up, and not so much with LEDs, but if you get some old conventional instruments and you lean up against a heat sink on one of them, um, you're gonna do some damage to the, to, the, to the harness, to the material. So you wanna feel it, because you're not always gonna be able to see it but it's gonna be brittle to the touch. It's gonna to feel a little bubbly. Most of you have seen what the end of a, a piece of rope, a piece of synthetic rope looks like when, um, uh, when you cut it with, a hot, with a, an electric or a hot knife. Uh, and it's that kind of thing, only you won't necessarily be able to see it as easily, but you'll certainly be able to feel it. That is the biggest issue with these. Um, the other thing that I would ask you to pay strict attention to is the stitching. And this is something a lot of people don't pay attention to. You know, this stitching is, has a contrasting color on purpose so you can see it. And it will wear out too. It's only thread, you know, just like everything else. It's just thread. If, for example, now on this particular harness, the end of the strap, the loose end of the strap is held by this little keeper here. And it's in a good place. This harness fits properly. There's not too much uh, excess hanging out here. But if you've got a harness that's too small for you and you end up with this end way up here by the buckle and you take a fall and the threads on the, uh, on the turn back are damaged, you could rip out those threads and pull the end of the strap through the buckle. It's not a common occurrence. It's pretty hard to do, but it's not impossible. Please keep an eye on it, okay? Um, Nick, I think it was you who asked me about marking harnesses, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that was me. And you asked me whether you can put a Sharpie on, on a harness. It's polyester, it's nylon, very, very little will damage the stuff, especially stuff that we come in contact with. Okay. We don't, you know, unless you're working with some acids and alkalis and, you know, really caustic materials, you know, unless it's got a lot of heat to it, it's not going to damage it. A Sharpie, for example, I mean, you know, you're going to run a Sharpie on your finger, you know, you right on your, the palm of your hand. Um, it's not going to damage it. You know, it's not going to hurt. It's not going to damage the, um, 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 the material of the harness either. That being said, however, let's not chance it because, you know, we'll all talk about Sharpies and then somebody will pick up some kind of other pen that's got some acid in it and right on their, on their, on their harness. Um, and it might cause a problem. So there is, and I can't see where it is on this particular harness, but there is a label and it's inside it. There it is. It's right in there next to the shock load indicator. There's a label right in here in a little Velcro um, pouch kind of thing. You wanna write your name on it, you wanna put some information on it, open it up and find a blank space on the label. Yeah, usually there'll be three or four pages and the back side of them will be blank. Write it there, you know? If you think that writing your name anywhere on a harness is gonna keep somebody from stealing your harness, yeah, good luck with that, okay? If somebody wants to steal your harness, they're not gonna care whether they, your name's on it or not. But if you wanna put it in there, a name or something in there as an identifier so you can tell it you know, apart from the other 17 harnesses in, 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 in the room, I would put it on the label. I would not put it on the harness itself, okay? Um, I think I've, you know, I've come, I've, you know, I've timed this reasonably well. It's an hour and a half, which is what I promised. And uh, that's kind of where we're at. 
uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting stuff. Uh, everyone should please feel free to email me. Um, and that's my email address. But uh, please feel free to email me if you have any questions or comments or concerns. And, um, and thank you. I have one. There's a question, I guess. A chat. Well, I got a Bravo. Cool. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you very much for, for putting up with me today. And I appreciate you, uh, you stopping by and have, um, have a good rest of the day or morning as the case may be. Okay. Thank you so much and uh, take care. Hey, Bill. All right. Bye-bye. Bill. Yeah, yeah. Somebody said. This is Andrew. Yeah. Got a quick question for you that doesn't involve the rest of the group, but I was just curious about something you said here. You're talking about house harnesses, keeping track of house harnesses when you went in the venue. Yeah. Did you? I, I will tell you personally, in all my years, I always carry my own harnesses, and uh, I have I have a real I have a real burr under my saddle about wearing a house harness. Okay. Um, do, what do you think? Do you uh, do you find one? I mean, I, I was in a position where I could afford to carry three harnesses with me, and I know most people aren't because that's that's that gets pretty costly. Right. But uh, what do you find? Do you do you find people are, are have the have the have the uh, have the standards of people keeping house harnesses in good repair come up since we're touring, or uh, or uh, do you find that people are more willing to wear house harnesses now? Because I, to be quite frank with you, I never trusted one, so I always carried my own. Okay. So, what What do you find that the situation is in the industry now about house harnesses? Okay, this is a a two part answer that is a, a larger topic. Okay, but number one, the regulations state that an organization can require you to wear their equipment, their safety equipment, if they so choose. Right? They can legally require you to do that. But the gear has to be in good condition and appropriate for the purpose. Um, that being said, I would always request you know, to wear my own harness. Um, my experience with harnesses, you know, in an organization, it's kind of 50 50. Um, we'll see some just absolute crap. Um, and then we'll see, you know, really good stuff in, in, in the next venue. Um, there's usually other indicators uh, that when you know, when you go into a venue, and you've seen it, you walk into a venue, and it's just, you know, it's a, it's a junkyard. You know? yep. Dirty. I mean, you've seen these places. You walk in, and you, you know, when you're done working, you want to take two showers. One to clean, you know, one because you're you're dirty and sweaty, and one to get whatever was in the building off of you at the same time. Um, you know, and they're usually going to have the junky harnesses that they leave on the floor that everybody steps on. Um, but I am seeing a higher awareness. I wouldn't say it's prevalent at this point, but it's getting there. You know, oddly enough, oddly enough, the uh, I, I what you were saying about that the, 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 the building can require you to wear their harness, mm -hmm. which is which which was was that was in force when I was out. Right. So, but uh, the way I always got it, the, the way I always got around that, first of all, I was very polite about it. I didn't go in with, you know, a chip on my shoulder or anything. But right. um, at that point, um, there was a I think it was a DBI Sala harness was the uh, considered like the state of the art harness that was the highest quality harness you could buy. Um, and I could be wrong, but I think that was the one I had and 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 I kept the all the paperwork and stuff on it Kept all the specs on it. And I said look Here's here's what you have and here's the specs on your building harnesses. Here's what I work with Here's what I'm carrying with me and it, it it's uh, it's okay it's, it's it's as good as if not better than what you've got. Are you okay with me wearing that and I never got turned down right and that's, so, that is the step that you would have to take to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. If you wear your harness, that's fine. But you got to go to whoever's responsible in that venue and make sure that they approve of that. Yeah. And, 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 be, and, be, uh, and be terribly polite about it or you won't get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but 
Yeah, I was just curious because it, you, you, you know as well as I do at one point that the house harnesses were something you wanted to avoid. And, and uh, I, I just, since I haven't been doing it, you know, for probably the better part of a decade, I was curious if that had, you know, how that had changed. Yeah. All um, right. Thanks a lot. I, I appreciate it. We'll see you later. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Once again, thank you all. I am, uh, I'm out of here. <laughs>